Okay, um, so I'd like to introduce uh, Jay Sanguinetti. Uh, Jay got his undergraduate degree from University of North Carolina, his PhD from University of Arizona at Tucson. Um, he's an imager and a brain stimulator, both two topics near and dear to my heart. And uh, today I'll be talking about uh, ultrasound, a relatively uncommon but potentially very useful method for brain stimulation. So join me in welcoming Jay. Thanks for having me today. Ooh. All right, let me go. Let's see if I can do it. So, imagine that we're all, yeah. Imagine we're all at a party later tonight, and in order to break the ice, I pull out a small device. I tell you, it's an ultrasound device, and by putting this on your head, I can make you feel happier. And make you feel calmer. If I put it on the top of your head, I can make you feel like you've had a 30-minute session of mindfulness meditation. If I put it on your visual cortex, I can give you better visual acuity, uh, maybe help you find the target a little easier, shoot a basketball a little bit uh, with a little bit more accuracy. You might look at me and think I'm some kind of charlatan, or maybe one of these people on the internet who puts a TDCS device on their head and records a video on YouTube of themselves passing out. I don't know if you guys have seen any of these do-it-yourself hackers on the internet. But actually, what I want to talk to you about today is ultrasound for brain stimulation. And what I want to do is try to convince you that ultrasound for uh, neuromodulation or enhancement of brain activity is a potentially powerful tool, um, both for trying to understand brain behavior relationships, as well as using it in clinical applications. And so at the University of Arizona, where we're doing this research, we're looking at both basic science, um, just trying to stimulate different brain areas to see if we can look at brain behavior relationships. We're also looking at this for um, therapeutic purposes in depression and other areas. So, is this, is this a little loud or is it okay? Um, I'm gonna be talking about ultrasound frequencies that are typically used for medical imaging all across the world. Um, so, of course, ultrasound is anywhere above 20,000 kilohertz, so that's 20,000 oscillations a second. That's above what the human ear can detect in terms of sound. And we're talking about frequencies all the way up to about 10 megahertz. Um, so, medical imaging is somewhere around 2 to 10 megahertz, so that's 10 million oscillations a second. So, right off the bat, um, you know that we're using intensities and power levels that are being used every day for medical imaging. So. Actually, there's a, a pretty interesting history of ultrasound being used for brain um, and nervous tissue modulation. Um, the first study, the seminal study, was published in 1929 by Harvey, and what he showed is that at certain frequencies, so this is 300 kilohertz of ultrasound, he could take live frogs and he could get them to jump, he could get the muscle tissue to twitch in the legs, he could get the eyelids to move, and he could also get the heart to stop and start. Um, I'm not going to talk about too much of the history of ultrasound, but there's been a sprinkling of studies from the 1920s up until about the 2000s um, where some of the reports using ultrasound for stimulation of brain and other tissues have been kind of miraculous. So, for example, the Russians back in the 1930s and 40s claimed that they could use ultrasound to implant thoughts and actually um, Mozart music into deaf people's heads and deaf people could hear with ultrasound. Um, I haven't been able to verify this or replicate any of these results, but there's been a very interesting history of ultrasound um, used to both modulate brain activity and other tissues. So I'm just going to talk about one study. Um, this is from a lab at Harvard. This is from the Brain Imaging Lab at Harvard University from U. What they did is they used a focus transducer. So this is an ultrasound transducer. You can use a wide beam. So for imaging, they just scan the ultrasound through the, through the tissue. Or you can actually uh, use a clever focusing mechanism and you can focus the ultrasound down to very small uh, scales. So we're talking millimeter precision. In this study, they had about three millimeter precision um, in the rabbit brain. And what they showed first is that one pulse of ultrasound, so you see the FUX means focused ultrasound. So one pulse of ultrasound at 300 kilohertz caused uh, an evoked potential, recording local field potentials from the somatosensory cortex. Um, you can see it in the ongoing EEG as well, 
And then what they did is they had a tiny little animal MRI and they found increases in blood flow to the region of the brain that they're targeting, and only that region in this study. Um, what's interesting about this study is that they actually used high enough intensity ultrasound that they could get the tail to twitch and they could also get the paws to move in the animal as well. So we're talking about precision on the millimeter scale and we're also talking about getting um, enough activity that you can actually get motor, um, motor activity in the animal. So in this study and most of the other studies, what they do at the end in the animal uh, models is they do histological analysis. So they dissect the brain and they're looking at different scales. So this is sub millimeter up to the millimeter scale in the brain. And what they do is they want to make sure that the intensities of ultrasound that they're using aren't damaging the brain. Of course, if we were at the party and I pulled out an ultrasound device and I said, I'm going to put energy into your brain, most of you are going to say, no way, you're not touching my brain. You know, the brain is composed of these networks of tiny, tiny bits of jelly, right? And now I'm putting mechanical pressure waves into your brain. Um, we have to be very careful about the type of energy we put in. And so in this study and in about 27 other studies that I've been able to find, they've looked at histological analysis at lots of different stimulation parameters of ultrasound, and no damage has been found under certain intensity levels. And so I'll tell you a little more, bit more about that. Um, this is a video from one of my collaborators' lab. Uh, this is Jamie Tyler, so some of you might know him. He has a company called Think. Um, this is actually the Think device. Um, so Jamie's really interested in non-invasive brain stimulation, and he's been publishing some really great studies. So what you're seeing here are calcium transients. They've stained the cells. And they're sending one pulse of ultras ultrasound into ex vivo neurons. So these are neurons just in a dish. And I guess it's kind of hard to see. Sorry about that. So the ultrasound pulse is right here. You can see the little light come up to signal when the pulse is coming on. What you see first is that there is a pulse of activity right at the ultrasound um, spot. But you also see that there's um, a sort of spreading of activation of the connected neuron as well. So we've been really interested in this phenomenon of ultrasound because what's happening is that we're sending a carrier frequency of ultrasound, so that might be 500 kilohertz, but we're pulsing it on and off, and that's one of the safety mechanisms to let the brain cool down. So what they found in this study is that if you pulse at one hertz, you get one hertz activation spreading throughout these neural tissues. Um, so you can imagine spreading at 10 hertz or 40 hertz if you're interested in the gamma frequency. So that's one of the effects of ultrasound, is that you seem to be getting calcium transients, you seem to be getting action potentials at certain frequencies of ultrasound. But you might also be able to get um, a, the ner nervous system to pick up on the carrier frequency that you're submitting with the ultrasound. So how does it work? Um, there's a couple different proposals about how ultrasound could be stimulating the brain. We know that ultrasound is going to interact with any medium that you put it through. So sound waves are interacting with the air, as my vocal cords move, for example. Ultrasound, we know, influences bone and tissue. Um, and at certain intensities, you can get the ultrasound waves to pass through without any damage. And so the idea is that you have a jelly-like substance, like this membrane, a cell. And what happens is the ultrasound wave passes through. And this guy wiggles, this girl wiggles, this girl wiggles, this guy wiggles, and then that information or that energy is just passed through the cell. And it's known that the ion channels have a stretch sensitivity. Um, so there's a theory of mechanosensitivity. And of course, all these things are like jelly, right? And so um, there's something like a spring, whereas if you, where when you put energy through them, they'll move and vibrate. And so um, there's about 12 or 13 studies showing that calcium, sodium, and potassium channels have a stretch sensitivity. Of course, each of them has a different um, structure to them, so the sensitivity is a bit different for each. Uh, but each of them responds to ultrasound pressure waves, and at the right intensities, you can essentially wiggle them open, getting sodium, potassium, and calcium to pass inside and uh, outside of the cell. So uh, the sort of classical mechanism would be something like that. Um, I should say that my collaborator, Stuart Hameroff, who I work with um, on the ultrasound studies, he has a different theory about this. Um, he has a somewhat, uh, well, actually, a highly uh, controversial theory of consciousness. He believes that microtubules are involved in consciousness through quantum physics mechanisms. 
Um, he has a theory of water Penrose, who won the Nobel Prize for physical quantum, uh, for quantum physics. And essentially what they think is that the activity is not just happening on the surface of the skull, but that the microtubules, which are inside the skull, are also responding to the ultrasound. <laughs> And it's been shown by independent labs that the microtubules have a resonant frequency um, in the megahertz range. So, you know, I'm, I'm open to the idea. I don't purport, um, I, I don't support this idea. I don't think there's any evidence for it or against it, but um, this is what my collaborator thinks is going on. Um, but at least for the evidence, um, we can point to some of the studies showing that the ion channels do seem to be sensitive to the ultrasound frequency. Okay, so there's lots of evidence. There's about 60 years of evidence that ultrasound can influence nervous tissue, nervous activity. The next question, of course, is, is that safe? What's nice about the ultrasound literature is that we have about 60 years of people doing all kinds of crazy things to themselves with ultrasound. Um, so it was discovered in the 1930s and 1940s that you could image with ultrasound. So this guy here is one of the discoverers of imaging ultrasound, um, the doctor. And what he's doing is imaging every part of his body. And here, every part um, he's doing is, is uh, uh, the part where the sun doesn't shine, um, <laughs> trying to image for uh, gallbladders, kidney stones, things like that. And so what's nice about the literature is that we can look through and see all the different intensities from basically 20,000 kilohertz and even below <coughs> up to many thousands of megahertz um, has been put into basically every part of the body. Um, so if we're worried about a certain intensity level of ultrasound that we're using, <clears throat> we have a literature that we can turn to to find out if it seems to damage uh, the body through thermal effects or other effects. Of course, today, ultrasound is being used um, for all kinds of other purposes as well. So there's cosmetic <coughs> ultrasound. It's been found that ultrasound can get bone tissue to heal quicker if you have a break or a fracture. Um, muscle therapy is being done on athletes all across, across the country. So um, we know at higher intensities, so here this is about a thousand times the intensity level that we're using. Even at those very high intensity levels, you can massage muscle tissue to get uh, therapeutic purposes, but you still don't even see damage at those levels. And so we're at about a thousand times lower even than what they're doing here. So of course, if you put energy into the brain, you can damage things. And so at very high intensity of ultrasound, you can destroy tissue. Um, so we know that you can do that with kidney stones and things like that. You can also uh, thermally heat up uh, cancer tissue in the brain. So this is actually what the Harvard lab is doing. In this system here, you have a thousand transducers on the outside of the head, so this is non-invasive. And they have a CAT scan, MRI of the person's brain, and they're sending all that information to a supercomputer. Um, it's one of the IBM supercomputers. So this is in an operating room. You have the patient sitting there with the cancer in their head. And what they can do is they can get all the ultrasound waves to summate to that spot, to the cancer tissue, and they can heat it up and ablate it. And what's interesting about these studies is that they don't want to burn the scalp, of course. That's the first worry. You also don't want to damage any of the cortex that are going down, right? You want to preserve all the function um, outside of the cancer tissue. And so what they found is that if they use enough transducers and they phase array them, so they use a clever stimulation sequence, then they can actually get the ultrasound waves to summate down to a very, very deep spot in the brain. Um, so this is just a simulation here, but they've been able to hit all kinds of different spots. They've done about 30 patients so far, um, I believe, and they're publishing some of these results with these patients. Um, after the patients pass away, you can look, in, look at their brain and make sure that you're not damaging any of that tissue as you're moving down. And they don't find any indication that the areas outside of the tissue, outside of the cancer tissue, are getting any damage. Uh, now again, this is very high intensity ultrasound. This is thousands of watts per centimeter square. Um, so this is much higher than what we're using. Did you have a question? Um, but what's interesting about this, and a point that I can make, is that we could use low intensity non thermal ultrasound, the type that we're using, with a, a phased array system like this. So you can imagine a million electrodes, a million stimulating transducers, and you could hit almost any spot in the brain. Now, with this system, you can't hit uh, edges, you can't hit, hit edges in the cortex at the, moment, at the moment, because you need to be able to summate the waves to a certain point. Um, but with a clever enough system, you, if you can imagine just a helmet with transducers in it, you can hit very deep brain structures, and you can also hit multiple structures at the same time. 
Um, so if you wanted to hit a whole circuit for various reasons, say a motion circuit, um, you could simulate one spot in time or multiple spots in time and then go out um, as you see spreading activation and stimulate before the, um, even the action potential is arrived. <coughs> So uh, you can also use ultrasound to open the blood-brain barrier, I have to say this, because um, this research is being done now. So you might want to open the blood-brain barrier to deliver drugs, for example, for Alzheimer's. Um, some of those drugs are too big to get through the barrier, and what they do is they use very high-intensity ultrasounds. This is 400 watts per centimeter square. So take a centimeter square of the brain and imagine putting 400 watts of power in, into it. And to get the blood-brain barrier to open, so there's these little T-junctions in the barrier, they can break those junctions open, but only if they put microbubbles into the bloodstream. So these are tiny little plastic bubbles. They inject them into the blood, and then they wait. They have little radio tracers on them, so they know when they get up to the barrier, and then they actually stimulate with the ultrasound there, and they cause those bubbles to shake sufficiently until they pop. It's called a cavitation effect. Um, so to get that type of damage in the brain, you have to use really high intensity ultrasound, and you also have to inject these microbubbles. What I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the day is low-intensity, non-thermal ultrasound. And you can see we're magnitudes below what it takes even to damage the brain. So this is about 200 um, milliwatts per centimeter square. Um, so that number is actually lower than what the FDA, uh, what the FDA limits for um, safe imaging ultrasound. So the FDA in, hu in an adult humans says that about 720 watts, milliwatts per centimeter square is safe. And even in fetuses, 96 milliwatts per centimeter square. So when they're imaging, um, when a mother is pregnant and they're imaging the fetus, they're using about 100 milliwatts per centimeter square. So the intensity levels that I'm going to talk about today are just about double that amount. Um, so it's, it's safe. It's just not enough power, actually, to damage anything in the brain. So um, I got interested in this research with uh, Dr. Hameroff. This is Stuart Hameroff here. He runs the Consciousness Conference in Tucson, and he has that controversial infamous theory of consciousness that I was telling you about. So Stuart got interested in this originally because of the microtubule idea. Um, it's infamously hard to test his ideas with Penrose. And Stuart saw the evidence that microtubules have a resonant frequency in the megahertz range, so the ultrasound range. And so um, he came to me and my advisor, and uh, actually we were in the hospital. I was doing a deep brain stimulation study. It's research I got involved with um, because of Jim Kavanaugh, actually. So we had spent about eight hours in the hospital. Um, this was with an OCD patient. They were putting a deep brain stimulator in her brain. So imagine having OCD, having to be awake for eight hours, and then uh, getting something put into your brain. She was very unhappy. It was very stressful, and it actually didn't work. And so we were leaving the hospital, and Dr. Hameroff comes up to us and says, I want to talk to you. And my advisor and I said, no, we just want to go get a beer. This has been the longest day. And he said, no, you, you can actually do that brain stimulation stuff you're trying to do without drilling into the brain. And so he took us back. He showed us a poster that he had. Um, and that's kind of how we got interested in all of this. And basically what Stuart did, um, he's an anesthesiologist in the hospital, so that's why he's in scrubs. And he had read some of the ultrasound studies and decided that he would take an imaging ultrasound. So this is a GE device. They use it in the hospital for imaging. And he just put it up to his head after work one day. And he did it for 15 seconds at 2 megahertz. And he said, well, about 10 minutes later, he didn't feel anything. And he said, OK, there's nothing to that. He can't prove his theory, or he can't test his theory of microtubules. And then uh, as he was getting into his car, he says he felt like he had had a martini. So he felt just a little, like a, you know, just a couple sips of a martini or something like that. And that's when he came to us and said, I want to try to replicate some of these results. So what he did is he took chronic pain patients. He's in the hospital. He has access to this patient population. And he put the ultrasound transducer. So this is a very big transducer. You can see it. It's a couple centimeters long. And he put it up to the contralateral side of the head to the pain. So there's no control for laterality here. If the person's pain was mostly on the left side of their head, you just put it up to the right. Um, and he did this in about 15 patients. What you can see with the ultrasound imaging device, which is nice, is that we're actually getting through the skull. So you can see that white part is the skull on the image. And you can actually see tissue. So we had radiologists confirm that this is actually brain tissue that we're imaging. So we know we're at least getting through the skull. 
uh, ultrasound is hitting some brain matter and echoing back through the skull. Um, we don't know in this study if it was stimulating, but at least we know we're getting through. And what he found is that there was a slightly um, but non significant decrease in pain perception. So it's like 0.07, which is not significant. Um, but he did find a significant increase in mood. So the participants who have a lot of problems with mood and depression as well, you have chronic pain, they reported uh, an increase in mood, an increase in happiness, uh, increase in calmness and things like that. So that to us was actually a significant thing because people with chronic pain typically, it's much harder to get them uh, to move on these mood scales. And uh, we in our lab, we have a, an effective electrophysiology lab, so we're very interested in mood disorders. And we looked at this data and we thought, well, okay, this is interesting, but are they getting happy because he's stimulating the frontal cortex? Or are they becoming happy because you're decreasing their mood? Um, these two things were confounded in this study. And we know that the frontal cortex is involved in emotion regulation, mood disorders, and mood perception. Um, so there's a network of uh, frontal cortex that's involved in emotional <coughs> regulation and mood disorders. My advisor, John Allen, um, has done a series of studies supporting the idea that there's an asymmetry in the frontal cortex if you look at EEG. So this is a depressed patient, she has an EEG on. Left frontal cortex relative to right uh, has a difference in the alpha rhythm, so the 10 hertz EEG pattern. So we know that the frontal cortex is involved in some of these mood disorders. And we thought, okay, if ultrasound is doing something to these mood areas, let's try taking healthy undergraduates at the University of Arizona, targeting their mood circuits, controlling for laterality, so only doing one side, and see if we can manipulate mood in these subjects. So uh, the data that I'll show you first is self-reports. Uh, we decided to go um, with the biggest net as possible first, instead of doing some type of emotion task or attention task, something like that. We decided to do self-report because we didn't really know how mood was going to be affected, if it was going to be emotion regulation or something else. Um, so we gave them a, a, a mood self-report scale, this is a visual analog mood scale. This has been used since the 1930s for self-report. Basically, subjects just report on a scale. Um, this is actually digitized. I wrote, I wrote a computer program to do it. But they basically report how alert they are, how sad they are, how tense, um, how much effort, how happy they are, um, how calm. And then we also gave them the PANAS scale, um, positive and negative affective mood schedule, so we could break apart positive and negative affect. And how we did it. Um, oh, and we used the, the medical imaging device in this study. So again, this is just a standard medical imaging device from the hospital. I actually had to do this in the basement of the hospital. This was in the summer in Tucson, so it was 110, 115 degrees. And my participants had to walk across campus um, in that heat, so 15, 20 minute walk. So most of them were pretty unhappy when they showed up to the lab and sway. And then they had to go down into the basement um, where the morgue is and things like this. So it's kind of a, not the best place to do this type of study. Um, but that gives you an idea of the context. And then what we did is we gave them the mood scales four times. We also recorded uh, EKG heartbeats. We wanted to look at uh, rhythmic sinus arrhythmia, RSA, and some other measures. And we gave them a baseline of all that. Then we stimulated. Five minutes later, we gave them the mood scales again. 15 minutes later, mood scales again. And 30 minutes later, mood scales again. And during the wait period, uh, we actually gave them a magazine called Arizona Highways. So it's a car magazine for driving around. Uh, most of the students are from Arizona and they didn't want to look at a magazine about Arizona, so most of them just kind of looked at it and, and put it down. We didn't let them use their phone um, and we didn't talk to them. We talked to them very minimally. Um, if they needed to use the bathroom or something, of course we let them go. Um, but basically, they're just sitting for about an hour, so it's a pretty boring task. <laughs> Now what we did is we aggregated those scores. So basically a move up on the scale means that they're reporting uh, more positive affect. So happiness, calmness, less sadness, uh, less tenseness, that kind of stuff. Um, and in other studies that use a visual analog scale, a move of about two to three points is normal for a person who has no manipulation. So if I just gave you this mood scale throughout the day, um, you'd probably move something like what happened in the placebo condition. Um, a significant move would be anywhere over two or three points on the scale. And so, of course, what you can see is that in our two megahertz ultrasound condition, 
relative to baseline um, or before stimulation, participants had a significant move in mood. We also asked them after the study, uh, what was it like? What did you think we were doing? Um, we asked them if they had any guess about the hypothesis, which none of them did. Um, but we also asked them to self-report, just how do you feel, how did you feel when you came in. Of course, most people felt tired and hot, because it was really hot when they came in. And most of them thought that we were imaging their brain, because it's ultrasound, and that's what most people think. And so they had no idea about the mood manipulation, but the participants in the 2 megahertz condition, um, out of the 16 subjects that we had here, I believe, or 14 subjects, uh, seven of them reported feeling some significant shift in mood um, that's not what they would normally experience just by coming into a hospital and sitting there. Um, in the placebo condition, only one subject reported a significant shift in mood, and it was a negative shift. So all the subjects in the 2 megahertz condition at least self-reported a positive shift in mood. Mm -hmm. How do you count for the three um, there's no significant difference, although it's pretty close, right? Um, so there's going to be some difference in baseline, and when we looked at individual subject differences, um, some people start out much lower than others, and it turns out that this group, um, overall, they just started out lower. Um, but it wasn't a significant difference, it was a difference of about five points overall. So were they pre-assigned? It was a random assignment. And also, I should say, this was uh, double-blinded, so we were using an imaging device, and you had to push a button. So we had two researchers come in. They were both blinded. Uh, well, the first researcher was not blinded. He or she came in, um, either turned the device on or off, and left before the second researcher and the subject came in. So the researcher who was sitting with the subject was blinded to the condition, and of course, the subject was blinded as well. Is there any, any kind of sensation for the from the stimulation? Or? Um, there's no sensation. If you get sensation from ultrasound, you're already damaging something. Okay. Um, so if you get any heating or anything like that, you're using high intensity, and that's what they use for muscle therapy. Um, so you do feel that type of stuff. There is a cold gel, so we did put the gel in both conditions of subjects. Um, and there, um, there's actually um, a clicking noise that you can hear, although most of the subjects claim they couldn't hear it. So we actually turned the ultrasound on at just a very low level in the placebo condition um, to replicate that clicking sound, just in case the subjects are hearing it. These are 18 and 24 year olds, so they probably have a little bit better protection of these high pitch frequencies. Um, but the ultrasound itself, of course, is 2 megahertz, so they can't hear that at all. So it seems like we could increase self-reported mood <coughs> in these subjects. So what we wanted to do next sorry, is that replicate these effects in a much larger study. So we entered into a collaboration with Jamie Tyler. He has this company called Think. Um, this is actually the Think device, if you want to try it later. Um, I'm not affiliated with the company. I don't work with them. I'm not taking any payment from them. Um, so I'm independent, um, although they have given us a small grant to do this research. And so before they developed this device, which is an alternating current system, um, they claim it's a, a cranial nerve stimulator. Um, they actually created an ultrasound system designed specific for brain ultrasounds. So it's a small transducer, you can see it there at the top, um, and they, they have the headphones just in case the subject can hear the clicking. And this transducer is designed specifically from the animal studies showing uh, what the optimal frequency to get the ultrasound through the skull is, which is about 300 to 500 kilohertz. Um, and what we decided to do is first try to replicate these mood effects. So this is my brother uh, modeling. And what we did essentially is we put this ultrasound device up to the head, um, same stimulation site as before. We used the 1020 EEG system to localize. And the difference between this and the last study is that this is not an imaging device, and this transducer is also focused. So the ultrasound is being focused down to about a five millimeter um, spot in the head. So we decided, well, okay, those ultrasound effects we got before might be because we're just stimulating you know, five or six millimeters or centimeters of cortex. But we really think that there's a specific spot in the brain, the inferior frontal cortex, the inferior frontal gyrus, that's leading to these mood effects. And so a focal ultrasound should give us a more focal effect. We also have models um, from Jimmy Tyler's lab to look at the depth of the ultrasound, as well as the intensity levels and what parts of tissue it should be stimulating. So you can see it's a relatively focal effect. Um, and it's a couple centimeters down where we get uh, the red is basically the intensity level of the ultrasound. 
Um, so this is just an average frame. We don't have any MRI data. And what we did in this study, uh, it was a huge study. So each one of these groups, waveform A, B, and sham, is 30 subjects. Um, so we had 90 subjects here, 90 subjects there, and 60 subjects here. And we stimulated right and left, different groups, and also a control spot on the top of the head that we thought wouldn't um, implicate mood in any sense. Uh, waveform A is based on the imaging device that we used before. Um, this is kind of a new parameter space for us, and so we decided to go after what had worked before. Waveform B is from the monkey literature, um, so there's lots of monkey studies with ultrasound for brain stimulation, so we thought we'd try that as well, and then sham was no ultrasound. Um, What we found on the right side is a replication of, of the effect with the waveform A. I have to apologize, these are different scores, but it's the same scale. So a move up again means a change in mood, a positive change in mood. And what you can see is there's more variability in this data, but uh, we found a waveform A, the subjects again reported an increase in mood. Surprisingly, it's 30 minutes after stimulation, which is not what we were expecting. Um, and the sham and the waveform B, we found no effect. And again, uh, we asked subjects to report at the end of the study what the, subject, what the study was like for them, what kind of changes they detected, um, things like that. And again, um, a little over half of the subjects in waveform A reported positive shifts in mood, so feeling happier, calmer, um, a little more in the moment for some of the subjects. Whereas the subjects in both of these groups reported either no change or negative changes. Um, so feeling tired, feeling a little down because we made them sit there for an hour and do nothing. I look at car magazines. Um, one subject uh, reported thinking about death. I don't know if that was an induction. It was actually in this waveform B group. Um, but no positive changes for those other two groups. Now, for the top of the head, this was supposed to be our control site. We actually got all kinds of interesting effects um, from this control location. So we gave them a non-attachment scale um, in this study. It's based on meditations. Uh, experiments and Buddhist literature on non-attachment. So basically it's as if you would have meditated and then you're sort of more in the moment, less attached to future and past thoughts, um, less attached to negative emotion, that kind of thing. And what we found is that the subjects who got waveform A at the top of the head actually reported an increase in non-attachment. So it's, it's, it was equivalent to about two days of meditation. So this is mindfulness meditation, 30 minutes a day. Um, so they reported being more in the moment, um, they were able to focus better, um, and they actually had a, sort of a less sort of rumination is the way that some of the subjects reported. These are all undergraduates, and we actually followed up, and we asked them how much experience they had with meditation. Um, only two of the 30 subjects had had any experience with meditation, so I don't know if they actually had the language to sort of describe what was happening to them. Um, interestingly, uh, that's a collaborator that's working on this. Four of the 30 subjects in the waveform B condition reported out-of-body experiences. So uh, the way they describe these is not like a spiritual thing, but more of like a, you know, when you're sleeping and you kind of float out of your body sometimes. Um, so much so that one of the subjects tracked me down the next day and asked if he could do it again. And I told him, no, the IRB is not going to allow me to do this to you. Um, <laughs> But we followed up with all these subjects, of course, because of IRB rules, and asked them if they were experiencing anything like this again. They didn't experience it again. Um, and only one of, the, one of the four subjects had ever experienced something like that in the past, and it was when he was falling asleep. So what's going on here? This is supposed to be our control side, right? Well, it turns out, uh, when we looked at the model, that what we were doing actually is stimulating somatosensory cortex, if, if we're stimulating a brain, that is. We uh, are simulating somatosensory cortex, and it turns out the arm and the genital representation area. Um, so some of my subjects actually reported that they were feeling sort of weird sensations. Um, the subjects who didn't report the mindfulness effects actually reported negative things. So they were kind of uncomfortable. Um, they sort of felt like they were sweating a little bit, things like this. Um, so it could be that we're getting some, kind, some type of sort of arbitrary input to somatosensory cortex, making them feel sort of strange, um, which might explain some of these out-of-body experiences. Although, I have to say, you know, I take that with a little bit of skepticism, because to produce an out-of-body experience through stimulation from outside of the head, you have to have a, a lot of energy being put into the system. Um, so, that needs to be replicated. 
On the left side, you might expect that we had the opposite effect. And actually, with waveform A, um, we found a non-significant shift again. Um, it looks like they were moving up and move, but it wasn't a significant change. The only significant change we get, um, if we don't find Bernie correct, is uh, in waveform B, subjects actually reported negative mood states. Um, so again, subjects were reporting thinking about death for some strange reason. Rumination on death, um, uncomfortable, disgruntled, angry, wanting to go home. These were the kind of things that they reported. Um, whereas the sham condition and the waveform A condition, they just reported their board and that's it. Um, so it seems like we weren't getting the opposite effect um, on the left side of the head, except for the waveform B condition, which is where we never found an effect before. Yeah? Are these the same subjects? These are different subjects. Um, so each location was a different group of subjects. Yeah, so all told, we had over 300 subjects in the study. A lot of subjects. Uh, took two semesters and a lot of research assistance time. Yep, and again, we followed up with these subjects. We asked them what they thought our hypothesis was, if they thought, you know, it, what they thought about the ultrasound system, uh, whether they felt any effects or anything like that. And the majority of subjects, it's less than 5%, actually guessed that we were trying to manipulate their brain in any way. Uh, most subjects thought we're trying to image because it's an ultrasound system. Um, and actually, I think it was something like 80% of the subjects guessed that they were in the placebo condition or the sham condition. Um, so most people, at least at the end of the study, were self-reporting that they were assuming they were in the sham. So we've also uh, started two studies looking at EEG. Um, so there is some preliminary evidence from Jamie Tyler's lab, our collaborator's lab, showing that at the site of stimulation, you get increases in cortical dynamics, the EEG, um, that's very transient, so it only lasts for about 500 milliseconds to a second. Um, but what hasn't been explored is what I was talking about before. Um, I'm going to the slide here. So the ultrasound is being sent at a carrier frequency, so this might be 500 kilohertz, 1 megahertz, 2 megahertz, but we're pulsing it on and off. And so we thought, okay, depression is related to 10 hertz alpha activity in the brain. If we pulse at 10 hertz, can we actually modulate that 10 hertz activity through ultrasound? So in the first study, um, we actually looked at 40 hertz, and then in a follow-up study, we're looking at 10 hertz. In the 40 hertz study, what we're finding so far is that at the site of stimulation, so this is a group of subjects, and of 20, we have ultrasound on their head, and then EEG all around. So of course, there's no EEG at the site of stimulation. Um, of course, ultrasound is mechanical vibration, so it doesn't affect the EEG waves at all. What we find is that in, there's an increase in about 35, 42, 45 hertz during stimulation and up to about two minutes after stimulation, and then that effect goes away. Uh, we don't find any changes on the left side of the head or anywhere else on the head in terms of 40 hertz or any other um, activity. Whereas if we look on subjects who get left side stimulation, we find increases in 40 hertz under or around the left electrodes, but nowhere else in the brain. Um, so this is a promising result to us. It's still a small study and we need to replicate it. Um, but this suggests that what you could do is you could use different uh, pulse frequencies of ultrasound to manipulate some of the cortical dynamics that might be related to cognition or other um, brain-related disorders. Jay? Mm -hmm. can, so uh, what, what is the difference between protocol A and B? In ultrasound, A was 2 megahertz, but? Uh, both of them were 500 kilohertz. Um, 500 kilohertz was what we were locked into <coughs> with that transducer, because okay. um, it was special made to be a focused transducer. What was different was the uh, duration, so the duty cycle, how long you have it on and off, as well as the pulse frequency. Um, so in waveform A, the pulse frequency was 40 hertz. Waveform B, it was 1,000, which was what was found in the animal studies to be optimal. Um, and the duration, so, sorry, I should have said this. Uh, in waveform A, the stimulation duration, the total duration of stimulation was 30 seconds, whereas in waveform B, it was 10 minutes. Um, and what we were doing in waveform A is we're pulsing at 40 hertz on and off, um, but the duty cycle was very, very small. Whereas in waveform B, the duty cycle was extended, so you have maybe 600 milliseconds of stimulation and then six seconds of rest. Six seconds of stimulation, six seconds. Was the energy deposition the same between them, or? Similar, it was different. It was, okay, yeah. which was higher? Waveform B, actually. Okay. 
Um, that's something that the animal literature suggests, is that higher power and energy doesn't always translate bigger effect. Um, and there's various reasons for that. It's probably because the ion channels, if that's the mechanism, um, they have a different structure and they're gonna, um, they'll be affected by different waveforms um, depending on the structure of the environment that they're in and things like that. Um, so it might actually be the case that we can drop the power level down by half and still get the same effects that we're looking at. So basically what we found is that uh, we replicated um, our imaging results with an ultrasound specific device um, and a high number of subjects. And then we see mood and EEG changes at site specific locations. So where are we gonna go from here? Um, the first study that we've started last semester is with um, participants who are presenting um, mood disorders. So these are participants who are not diagnosed with depression, but they're high on the VEX depression inventory. And what we want to do is stimulate right frontal cortex and see if we can um, change some of those mood symptoms that they have. So they're getting four stimulation, um, they're getting four uh, doses of stimulation once a day, um, usually four days in a row, and then they get the option to come back um, the next week. They're getting EEG the first day and the last day. Um, we're also getting the mood scales and things like that. One group is getting active stimulation, one group is getting sham. <coughs> we're about halfway through, and we haven't looked at the data yet. We're going to wait until the end of the study for that. Um, but what we're expecting there is to see some change, um, at least on the Beck's depression inventory, and probably self-reported mood. But also, uh, we're stimulating at 10 hertz, and so we can look at the EEG to see if the participants who um, are showing a change in mood or depressive symptoms are actually showing a change in brain activity as well. So this will be the first time that we link these mood effects to the brain effects. Um, we're also starting a study with Alzheimer's patients. This is taking a really long time to get off the ground for various IRB reasons. Um, but there is some evidence from the uh, mouse literature that ultrasound can influence um, part of the disease. So in these animals, they're genetically altered to have the beta amyloid plaques. They don't have the tau proteins, they don't have inflammation, so they're actually missing two-thirds of the disease. Um, but they do have these beta amyloid plaques, and what's been found is that in about 75% of the rats, um, ultrasound, so of course the transducer is the size of the mouse's brain, right? It's the size of their whole head. So we're getting ultrasound to the whole brain. They get it for 30 minutes a day, up to four weeks, I believe. And what they find is that 75% of these rats actually have an almost complete reduction in the beta amyloid plaques. And in those rats who have that reduction, they actually perform the memory tasks like normal rats, uh, normal mice. Um, so that's an encouraging result. The idea is that the ultrasound is actually stimulating glial cells, and the glial cells are removing the plaques. Um, so what we're doing is we're starting a study with the ultrasound. Uh, it's just saying what I just said. We're starting a study with Alzheimer's patients. Um, we're going to do right and left temporal cortex. So we're going through the temporal window, which is the thinnest part of the skull. And we're gonna do um, two minutes at different locations, doing it twice a week for four weeks. And the idea, I, mean, I don't think we're gonna remove the plaques in these patients, their brains are much bigger, um, but the idea would be either to slow the disease down or at least give them some cognitive functioning, so memory capacity restored, um, even if we can help them brush their teeth at the end of the day, something like that would be significant. Um, so we're starting the study with 40 patients, um, open label, we're just taking all Alzheimer's patients. We're also thinking about doing this in traumatic brain injury patients, um, as well as other patients with dementia as well. Uh, we've also started a study with working memory. Um, so in both TMS and TDCS literatures, you can target the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex on the left and increase working memory capacity. The effects are relatively strong in TMS. Um, they're consistent, but pretty weak in TDCS. And so we decided, okay, there's a nice literature of a task that we could use. So uh, one of our honors undergraduate students is targeting the DLPFC on the left in healthy undergraduates. They're using the NBAC task, so it's a pretty taxing uh, memory task, the task working memory. And the first pilot study, we have actually found no effects, um, I'm sad to say. And one of the reasons we think is because this part of the skull that we're going through is relatively thick. Um, it's twice as thick as where we've been going through so far. It's about uh, seven millimeters here versus three. 
And so what we're doing now is trying to figure out the right parameters to actually get the ultrasound through the skull. Um, we know based on animal literature that the skull is going to be a limiting factor for the ultrasound. So it attenuates about 50% of the power of ultrasound, and it actually focuses the ultrasound a bit through. Um, so what we're doing now is going back to the drawing board and trying to figure out what the optimal parameters would be to get the ultrasound actually through the skull. So the idea would be to make a working memory system a little healthier. Um, so that's all I have. I just want to thank all the collaborators. This is my advisor, John Allen, um, Stuart Hameroff, Jamie Tyler and his company, and then a host of graduate students and undergraduates that have helped as well. Thanks. Great talk. Um, I just had a quick question about the target of your um, ultrasound stimulation to modulate emotion. Um, how do you control for other factors that bright eye is involved in, like uh, attention alerting or just general, you know, part part of the right lateral eye's attention network? So what if people are just tending more to negative or positive thoughts versus just modulating you know, emotion? It's a good question. Um, that's one of the reasons we put, so we put some other scales that I didn't talk about. So the mindfulness scale was one. Um, we put some other self-report scales. We actually allowed them to openly write. So we gave them a paragraph and we said, write about whatever you want. And we're doing actually like a word analysis to see if they use positive and negative words. Um, if, you'd have, if you would have expected them to be attending to positive versus negative, for example, um, we might have I guess assuming that the right frontal cortex would make them attend to say negative over positive, um, you might assume something like that. Then we would expect it to see a negative effect in all the subjects. Um, we were actually surprised to see the positive effect because the frontal asymmetry literature would suggest stimulating on the left would lead to positive effect, stimulating on the, on the right would lead to negative. We actually found the opposite effect. Um, so we think we might actually be inhibiting the system or putting noise into the system. Um, but if if you were to argue that they're all attending to positive feelings or something like that, I mean, that could definitely be driving these effects as well. So the next few studies we want to do is try to parse some of the other part. We're doing an attentional emotion task um, to see if we can parse the part of positive versus negative effect. We'll probably do some other things like the emotional shrew um, to try to get at some of these questions. But at the beginning, we didn't really know what to expect. We don't know if the ultrasound is stimulating or inhibiting. Um, so we decided to just go as open as possible and try to see, you know, what's stuck. Hi, a lot of food for thought in your talk. Thanks a lot. I was wondering, has, has there ever been any studies looking at cortical excitability after this kind of ultrasound to the brain to indicate whether there might be an excitatory or inhibitory effect of that? Mm -hmm. uh, the U lab at Harvard has been looking at that. Um, so the rabbit study that I showed you. They actually showed both excitation and inhibition um, with electrophysiology and MRI. And in that study, what they found is that at the intensity levels that we're using, so somewhere around 300 milliwatts per centimeter square, uh, you seem to get excitation, although that's not, some studies actually show inhibition. If you go higher intensity, so up around one to three watts per centimeter square, you get inhibition. Um, but then that, of course, is higher than we want to put to the in that study, they actually found no damage at those intensity levels. And you have to keep in mind the skull of these animals is much thinner than ours as well, so they're actually getting more power through. Um, but still, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable doing that on myself, so I'm definitely not going to do that on subjects. Um, but there is some suggestion that at higher intensities versus lower, um, you might find these effects. And also, this, this sort of pulse frequency that you're using, much like TMS, you know, at, I forget, I think it's low uh, frequency TMS, inhibits and high frequency stimulates or vice versa. Um, that seems to be the case, uh, but different brain regions are interacting differently. And I think that's probably because of the tissue that you're going through as well as the structure of the sites that you're interacting with. Um, it's really a mess. I mean, it's just like with other brain stimulation methods. Every neuron isn't going to interact the same with this energy. Um, so we have to consider both the parameter space of the ultrasound, but as well as all the tissue that it's interacting with, and then the individual difference. Uh, it's a good question. We didn't know how long the effects would last. And actually, in the Hammer study that I showed you with the pain patients, they use a crossover design. 
and their effects uh, were weak, sort of suggestive, and so we wanted to separate out the subjects um, and use a between subjects just to try to see you know, if there were any effects that were lasting in time. Um, the first two studies we did a follow-up. We did a two-day and then one-month follow-up as well. Um, so we wanted to sort of separate out the effects of sham versus stem to see if we could pick up on anything. And actually, um, in, in that first study, when we did the follow-up, the subjects who reported some subject, subjective changes, so the ones who actually said after the study, I do feel like something happened, um, one day and one month after they still felt, uh, sorry, one day after um, they still felt like some change had occurred. But of course we had to explain the hypothesis at the end of the study and everything. So. Well, so the second question is, um, what was your consent form language about the purpose of the study? Because later obviously you're asking them, so up front what were they told about the study? So this tells you a lot about consent forms. Uh, we actually said this is a study where we're stimulating your brain and we're going to give you mood scales. Um, <laughs> our subjects do not read these things. And I actually, so we, we debate back and forth about whether we should read them to them. Um, my voice tends to put my subjects to sleep, so I don't read it to them. Um, but I think that actually reading to them actually makes them pay attention even less. And so I've actually, in my post-experiment question, I asked my subjects if they read the consent form now. And 90% of them admit, no, I didn't read it at all. I just, so you, know, you told them up front exactly what it was, and then later they weren't able to tell you what the study was and you were asking them. We told them we're using ultrasound to stimulate the brain, um, or some, some language, but a little more vague than that. Um, we didn't say anything about imaging, and we told them that this, well, we actually said this is a safe level of ultrasound-like imaging, so maybe they picked up on that as they were going through, I'm not sure. Um, was it mentioned to see if there was an effect on mood? In the, in the, no, the IRB just made us put it in. Um, because this is sort of, sort of a new area, the IRB wants us to be very careful about what we tell subjects. Um, because we are putting energy into their brains. So we want to make sure they understand that um, so they can consent to it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. My question is really similar to that. I was just wondering what the expected duration of the mood effect is. Uh, I was expecting a couple minutes. Actually, um, so to find that we're getting 15 to 30 minutes out is one suggesting that the effects are not due to the ultrasound stimulation that that's happening. It's something else that's happening in the brain, and that's why I think these changes in cortical dynamics might be one hypothesis. Um, there is some talk about LTP and LTD, just like with, with the other stimulation methods, um, but there's not a lot of evidence for that. So all the brain stimulation studies, when they do show an effect, either in <clears throat> MRI or in local field potentials. Those effects are 500 milliseconds to maybe a couple minutes out. So no one's ever shown these longer effects as we're showing. Um, in the EEG data, we thought we had it, um, and it turns out that the data wasn't clean. But there was another grad student processing it. Um, so the data was messy. We thought we were getting an effect out at about 30 minutes, but as we clean the data, um, as you should, we're actually finding that the effects are only about two minutes after. Um, they looked out to 40 minutes and then they did the crossover um, and stimulated or didn't stimulate. And they actually found that the chronic pain reduction was reported um, 10 to 20 minutes. Excuse me. And the mood effects were reported up to 40 minutes. So that's the longest mood effect that we found actually is the 40 minutes. Um, and the, the post one day follow up. I'm curious about your thoughts on the more vocal stimulation approaches. You know, it's, it's kind of like you're, you're taking a really big hammer and now you're making a really small, precise hammer. Yeah. Um, so do you, do you think that in, when you're using that, you're going to need to do you know, maybe a, a preliminary round of imaging first and really make sure that you're targeting specific structures? And a follow-on question to that is, um, do, you, do you think that the modeling tools for achieving that kind of targeting with this ultrasound skill, um, do you believe them? Um, so for the imaging, uh, initially that's what we wanted to do. So of course ultrasound being mechanical vibration, um, it doesn't affect MRI at all, which is a huge advantage. So you can go deep in the brain, it doesn't affect MRI or EEG. Um, so we actually ha have an MR compatible ultrasound on the way, um, although I just got news that the Chinese government destroyed it through customs. <laughs> so uh, my collaborator was taking it over for whatever reason. Um, so that, that was actually something we were going to try to start this month. It looks like we're going to be delayed a bit. Um, 
So I think that would be the only way to make strong claims with these sort of ultrasound systems. And that's what the animal studies have been doing. So for our study, uh, we used the 1020 system. So we put an EEG cap on, we marked it with a marker. But of course, there's you know centimeters of error with that. Um, we've actually shown that in a couple studies. So we don't make any strong claims about stimulating you know, specific spots until we can do some kind of imaging. Um, the models are, um, so they've actually created that model in my collaborator's lab. They haven't done any kind of uh, MRI or any kind of follow-up to confirm. Um, so it's hard to know, but basically what they did is they fed in the MNI, um, the 250 brain space. So it's an average brain, and then they took the parameters of ultrasound that they have. And we know quite a bit about how the skull will interact with ultrasound. And that's because the studies where they're ablating cancer tissue, they need to be very, very precise, or else they'll burn the skin, they'll destroy the skull, they'll damage all kinds of stuff. Um, so we have a nice literature about that. The big unknown is what's happening in between the skull and the brain tissue. So you've got the meninges and all those um, support cells, and then you have the cerebral spinal fluid. And uh, actually, the biggest mystery with the model is when you start shaking the fluid, you're going to get um, basically the same effects that you get with air at um, the edges of an airplane. So you get all these kind of strange effects with turbulence and things like that. So that's a big unknown. That could be causing little cavitation bubbles, which are doing things in the brain. Um, we think that that's probably safe in terms of damaging anything, but it's going to be affecting. So you can imagine if you've got a receptor site and you've got some kind of turbulent effect on the outside, that's going to influence it differently than if you're sort of massaging it with an ultrasound wave. Um, so we don't know how much air that effect is causing because you know, the math is very complicated. Yeah, especially in the case if you start to get down to microtubules. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah? So as a follow-up, <clears throat> if you're thinking about someone with a stroke who has a fluid-filled lesion with like an astrocyte scar around it, what do you think about the safety or, or, or how to approach even beginning with the stroke population to have lesions in the sphere um, versus maybe staying in the unaffected hemisphere for any kind of interventions that you might do? Um, it's a funny question, as my grandfather had a stroke and also has um, a fluid field sac in his brain, and I thought about doing both ultrasound and TDCS on him. Um, the problem with anything with fluid is you have to worry about uh, gas pockets. So anywhere where there might be some air, um, that could be, be potentially dangerous. So with all ultrasound systems, you never want to put one up to your lungs, for example. Because what you can do is shake that gas, and that gas is going to shake violently until it pops. It's called a cavitation bubble. Um, so the FDA and any kind of regulation agency says to stay away from stuff like that. Um, I would be scared, you know, if you have a cyst or something like that in the brain, just you know, you wouldn't want to ultrasound that because you are shaking, like literally shaking the system. Um, in terms of stroke recovery, you know, there are there is some TDCS and TMS literature on that. And so that's an area that we've proposed, um, but since we're starting so many studies right now, I think we'll have to wait. But you can imagine if ultrasound is actually stimulating um, certain brain areas, you could stimulate some frontal cortical areas, um, so DLPFC, for example, and you might give them some recovery. Um, but you know, we don't know yet. I'm just thinking, because I, I was still um, very nervous for the reasons that you mentioned uh, in the lesions in the sphere, but in the unaffected. Yeah, I think it would be doable as long as you're, you know, 99.9% .9 sure you've got the right hemisphere, right? Because um, that's the difference, is that's potentially dangerous if you get the wrong side. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if you targeted even some of the memory areas, you might be able to increase memory capacity, and you, would, you might only need one hemisphere to do something like that. Yeah. I guess just to speak to Jessica's question about safety, I mean, would there are other ultrasounds in medicine like um, transcranial Doppler you know, ultrasound that is used in post-stroke patients. There's cardiac ultrasound where they put it into the esophagus and got it right next to the heart. So I guess I'm, I'm, I'm curious about sort of these other applications. Are those other applications much different than what you guys are doing such that you would expect a different safety profile? So Doppler is actually interesting because the intensity level is much higher. Um, 
And in some of the Doppler studies, they're leaving the Doppler on for a long time, so 10, 15 minutes. And it's actually, uh, in some of the Dopplers, it's a continuous wave, which is potentially dangerous. I mean, the Doppler is being used safely now. Um, but we actually looked at the Doppler literature to look at the higher limit that we could go with the imaging device. And of course, I tried Doppler on myself. You know, I, I did it all over and didn't feel anything. Um, but what's interesting about the Doppler literature is there is a, a bit of anecdotal evidence from doctors using it where they put it up to the patients, do some imaging or some blockage imaging, and the patients actually reported changes in mood or um, sort of, in the TDCS literature, they call it a clean windshield effect. So it's as if you realize your windshield is dirty and you clean it off and everything's a little glistening. Um, so there have been some self-report things like that in the literature, but you know, nothing 